I'm Neil Dubord, Chief of the Delta Police Department. This week on our show... It got to a point at home where I just, I, I couldn't exist there anymore. And, you know, it, uh, again, it's almost that, <laughs> whether it's contagious or not, you start thinking, you know, and, and you do. You look at your gun, you say, this might be the answer. And I mean, I was at that point. Bend, don't break. This is a Delta Police podcast. Hear more about how police officers strengthen their resiliency through the power of story. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you being here. And, and certainly you've been a longtime member of the Delta Police Department. And in your, your service here, I know that uh, the members look up to you and you have huge credibility within this department. So we appreciate you being able to share some of your strategies and some of the struggles that you've gone through and, and how we can help other people through the power of your story. Let me start off really easy. What did you have for breakfast this today? <laughs> I was fortunate. <laughs> I actually had an omelet. My wife made me a really nice spinach omelet. Look so, at that. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, that's good. Well, you're certainly looking in good shape, so you're taking your your, your good physical care of yourself, so that's great. Um, favorite movie? Uh, you know what? Anything with a any any old duster and I'll uh, uh-huh. I'll, I'll I'll watch it. So yeah, I like the old uh, the old westerns. So, oh, good for you. Now now this series that we have is is called Bend Don't Break and it's the, the whole idea of us being able to share Uh, stories with people and from those stories there's learnings that we can take away that help us be able to deal with and cope with challenges that we may be facing in our lives whether that be emotionally physically or mentally and how we get through it as you know this job is hard on people we do wear people out over the course of a 30 or 35 year career and we want to make sure that we we do all we can to support all the first responders but certainly police departments as we are police officers as we're talking today so tell me a little bit about just sort of uh, what year you joined and then sort of how you you got forward within the delta police department yeah thanks this is a great opportunity i think to be able to uh, share my story and Hopefully it can help other people out. Uh, it's kind of timely in that uh, I'm in 20, 26th year and coming up to the end of a career that started in 1992. I moved out here from Edmonton and started with the Delta Police and was previously a lawyer and thought I'd do it for a couple of years and head back to law to practice law. But uh, policing has a way of grabbing a hold of you and keeping you. And uh, actually looking back, it was uh, I'm very fortunate to have had the opportunity to to, to serve uh, Delta and really be a, and experience the, the, the opportunity to be a police officer. Um, my whole career has basically been in uniform. I, most of it was spent in the dog it. section. Yeah. Um, you know, the last three years is great. I had an opportunity to finish my career at the uh, gang task force, leading a team of uh, uniform members that basically went out and were doing, you know, basically dealing with the bullies and it was a great way to end off a uniform career so um you know and over the time of the what really makes it poignant right now is the fact that i'm at the point in my career where i see that a lot of the people i mean i can i was thinking about it before i got here and there's at least eight to ten people that i can say right now that are seriously experiencing the effects of policing diagnosed PTSD and uh, it's again I, I don't like using I mean you can call it what you will but I just think it's the wear and tear of policing and you see it over years um, and especially at the end of your career when you look at the people and the effects that it's had and again if there's something that you can do to bring awareness to that wear and tear and help Maybe if even it's just one person, even if it's just something that can someone's going to you're going to hit a a note or or maybe a little pearl that you can drop that's going to help someone else out. I think this is uh, definitely worthwhile. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to just talk a little bit about sort of what I know of you. And and I didn't know you. I I come from Edmonton as well, so I didn't know you in Edmonton. But I certainly know of your expertise and how highly people think of you in relation to your dog work, your canine work. And I know that you were a supervisor there. You were a a certified trainer and and you brought our program forward in the Delta Police Department significantly. So certainly people know you around Delta as your great work within the canine unit. So thank you for all of that service that you brought to us and, and what you did to change our police department as well uh, but so sort of walk us through sort of what uh, sort of your relationships and how that sort of works up and and your your work is in canine a little bit 
Yeah, I mean, the, the work in canine was fantastic. I mean, I got hooked, and once you're hooked, you kind of, uh, it wasn't easy at the beginning. There were obviously a lot of hurdles that you go through with getting dogs, and the time that I started the program wasn't really uh, looked upon as a go-to section. Um, so I think over the years, uh, I think just in policing in general and the, the, the dynamics of the department, things change, and I think we were able to really change the perception of a of canine. I mean, it's a, it's a special job, and I think anyone that's done the job will say it's probably some of the best time they've had in their career. And I was really lucky to get a chance to spend so long in it. Um, you know, but like anything else, something you're very passionate about can be beneficial, but then it can also become destructive. And, you know, there's over the years, there's, I mean, I can look back and see that, you know, the passion and the time and the effort that I put in did have consequences in my personal relationships. Um, I never, I mean, never got married probably because of the fact that I, you know, never had kids probably because of the fact that I was the, the amount of time I spent on my job. And I mean, I don't regret it, but I mean, that was, you know, that was part of what you did. It was just, you either canine is 24 seven. You're not, you're not stopping your shift and going home. Uh, it's, it goes all the time. And then once you get into a position where you start training, you take on the other teams and it's a, it's, it's definitely a labor of love when it comes to that kind of stuff. Tell me a little bit about that relationship you, you, you had. I know that, uh, you certainly live for a period of time with another police officer and, uh, Tell me a little bit more about that, sort of how that all came about. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, at the time it was, you know, you start a relationship, it was fantastic. I ended up reconnecting with uh, one of my classmates from the academy. We were extremely tight in the academy. Um, you know, she was, uh, you know, there was, we were just friends. It was colleagues, uh, totally respected her. We had a lot of fun. We sort of lost touch and then uh, it was we just got our new MDTs and I got a, it was New Year's Eve and I got a MDT message from her saying, Hey, Borgie, you know, this is cool. What are you doing? <laughs> and so we ended up kind of touching base and she was single and I was single and we actually ended up uh, establishing a, a relationship and, you know, from, it was fantastic. And, you know, at the, at the time and, you know, anyone looking at, at it from the outside was like, wow. And, and, and it, and from the outside, it, it, it looked fantastic. I mean, we had a couple of acres in Langley with horses and, um, we're, you know, living together and, and, and actually from the outside, it looked great. And there was so many great things about it. Uh, again, though, that wear and tear of policing, you know, and again, my inability to probably deal with the situation at hand, uh, that typical police, I'm not gonna, I can do this on my own. I don't, I don't need any help. So again, as things start unraveling in your home life, you, if you don't have the tools to deal with it, you sort of make up, you know, again, policing the ways and means act, you try yeah. to, Hey, you just get her done. And, uh, you know, again, this, you know, my partner, fantastic lady worked hard, was extremely well, uh, respected at work. I mean, like I was, said, we sort of had that discussion before and, I mean, you get a five foot two Chinese gal that heads out to Matsky 27 years ago to work with a bunch of Neanderthal policemen, which is probably what I was at the time too. Uh, <laughs> political correctness was not so much there, nor was, uh, um, you know, I mean, you basically put out or got out. And if you weren't tough enough to do the job, you were basically, no one cared. You and were, she's a good cop. And she did it. And she established credibility and she was, she was well respected both amongst the, you know, the senior guys and the junior people. And I still have relationships with some of the senior guys that she worked with at the beginning and they would go to the wall for her. So again, she had great credibility at work. Um, but you know, again, there was that wear and tear of the job and, you know, and again, melt, mental illness, depression, and that kind of stuff that, that she was dealing with. And, and when you put, when I tried to deal with it and it, I just didn't have the tools. So first part of the relationship, uh, we had Chief Bob Rich in here previously, and Chief Rich talks a little bit about sort of what Abbotsford has been through, and, and, and I know 
that uh, this lady also worked for the Abbotsford. Matsqui turned into Abbotsford at one point in time. And uh, th- that relationship started off working very well, obviously, and, and moved in together and were establishing yourself and, and things were going well. And what were the signs you were starting to see of depression and sort of maybe some potential mental health issues? You know what? I'd never, I'd never been privy to any of that before. And uh, I remember we'd started living together and she just went into the room and said, I'm in a funk and I'll be out in three days. And it was like, and it was three days, basically three days. And, you know, and she basically went dark and that was it. And she says, you can't help me. I just got to get through this. And I was like, okay. I mean, for me, I mean, again, I mean, I have a background in psychology. I have, I'm not, I'm not a total, uh, I'm not totally unaware of what, of what goes on but again not being privy and not being savvy in terms of what to do in those situations you just sort of okay well this must be what happens and then as you get to know the person you hear their story and you start seeing reasons why you know the the things that she's gone through and previous and again, trauma right just previous trauma and then yep. again that wear and tear of even the job we have uh so you know again those periods you know, it got to the point where you could even start predicting when these periods, the, you know, the funk would come on or, and so you just sort of prepared for that. And I mean, it never affected her work. She was extremely capable. Um, but again, when she'd come home, that she would sometimes it'd be, she'd work for four days, come home and go to bed for four days. And you get to the point where you see how the the condition is wearing on her and some of the inner turmoil that she's going through and you start realizing that there's a a dark side there where and i mean to be quite honest it's it's the suicide part and you start realizing that this person that that is an option that they are considering and you try to get help i know that a number of people close friends have tried to get her help but she knew what to say to the doctors and, and she, you know, again, you can leave the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. She was on medication, I gather, for it as well. She was on medication, but again, it's, you, I think what happens and it's, I've seen it in other areas of society, you get a pill and you think everything's done. And again, you know, I think when I met her, she'd been on the same medication for 10 or 15 years. So at least she was able to get back. I mean, through discussions to say, look, go back talk to your doctor like she was on she was trying I mean she went to the doctor she you know was trying different medications she was trying to to work on it and and at but at the same time you're trying to make things work she's trying to make things work if you settle into that routine and that just you know it was very hard I mean you know living with that was was it, it has its toll so what would happen on special occasions like a Christmas or something like that? Yeah, you know, I remember Christmas days driving around by myself with her being in bed. And, you know, I remember going to a buddy's place. He was out of town and just hanging out there. Just, you just don't, there was no point in being at home. So, but there was something to do. And, uh, yeah, it was, there was a lot of times. I mean, I would go away for work and she would just turn off the phone and I would know what's going on. So it, it literally got to the point where I, I mean, I was scared to go home, you know, even at, at night going home, if the, if the house is dark, I was scared what I'd find when I got home. So what's that doing to you? I can't imagine the stress and how are you managing your own stress? You know what? I mean, you, again, you, you throw yourself into your job try to be a good cop you you know the the fact is with the dog section it was great because I could put as much time into it as I as it would take it it's you know it sucks you in and so do that I mean we had horses there was just I mean to be quite honest running the household was a full-time job so you throw yourself into that but again it's when that's wearing on you it it does have an effect I remember I saw I went saw a psychologist I told her she found out about it and it was like just we it was an issue we just didn't deal with 
and I went and saw the psychologist and he kind of, we chatted and I never went back. And I think most of it was because she found out and never asked about it again. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess just <laughs> suck it up, yeah. buttercup. And uh, so over time, it just got to the point where I was, I mean, I don't know what it is about depression, but it's almost like it can be contagious. And I found myself becoming more and more, you know, withdrawn, um, you know, and, and what's going on at work here as well. Cause yeah, I mean, I mean, these changes are happening. I imagine are, here. Yeah. And, and the thing is you're, you know, things are going on, but I mean, at that time things were relatively stable. I was enjoying my career. It was yeah. perfect. Like okay. love my job. So great jobs, great home sucks. And, uh, you know, and then, just like anything else, things sort of come to a head. And the point, it got to a point at home where I just, I, I couldn't exist there anymore. And, you know, it, uh, again, it's almost that, <laughs> whether it's contagious or not, you start thinking, you know, and, and you do, you look at your gun, you say, this might be the answer. And I mean, I was at that point, um, you know, and it's, you, you, you go so far down, you don't even want to think about it. But you, when you start realizing that, hey, uh, this is becoming an option for me, it's like, I got to do something. So I had friends and I went, they're mutual friends, and we sat down and talked about it. And they were like shocked. And, you know, and they basically. From the outside, it was perfect. Yeah. And they, yep. and they basically said, you got to do something. So I made the decision and I left, which was tough because, again, you feel like you're abandoning your partner and, you know, and you don't want to abandon them because you know they're in a world of hurt. But you're saying sort of like when they you love her, you love her, yeah, guaranteed, yeah. And, and it's you know you don't want to see them hurt, but they're it's almost like you know, and they use that analogy when you uh, in the airplane put the oxygen mask on your kid first because if you're dead, you're not going to be able to help them. So I knew that I had to do something for myself. So I left, but you know I was lucky enough to get a buddy that put me up in his basement. But you know I spent six months there with a bed and a chair and never did anything to improve my situation. You know, again, it's sort of that self-imposed exile that you put yourself in, but on the outside, again, you know, you're still at work. No one really knows what's going on. Um, we have a tendency in policing to be able to use black humor and kibitz it away and, you know, hey, just another typical cop. Well, there's another ex and probably lose that house too. And so you, I mean, we, you use those types of things and it's, it's humor and <laughs> unfortunately it's, true. it is. Yeah, um, true. But you know, at the same time, you know, the... So you're in the spiral. I'm in the spiral. Right, you're, and you're then, going and, down, and yeah. once you start going down, I mean, then the canine thing happened and, you know, the uh, Delta decided it was going to... Uh, contract at services with the RCMP with canine. So notwithstanding that uh, the RCMP and I was in constant touch with the RCMP and the, the inspector running it, she was actually used to work here as a drug member. So I knew her quite well. Um, you know, she was saying, look, we want you to come over. And I actually was in, Sur in Surrey and saw my name on the board. And, but the management at the time in Delta didn't want to, didn't want to send me. And whether it was punitive or, or, you know, in, it, there was sort of a personal thing there. I don't know, but that's the way I took it. Um, you know, looking back, I think there was a lot of that there, but uh, it didn't help my situation because, again, this is something that I'd invested everything and I'd relied on it and it was my stability and it had been pulled away. And at, so, at this, so obviously those types of things starts happening, your health starts being affected. So at the time I'd had problems before with pancreatitis well, I started having more problems. So specialists get involved, and all of a sudden they think, yep, I had pancreatic cancer. So they were looking to do tests to confirm that. And uh, so there I am sitting in the basement suite, you know. And with a chair. With a chair. <laughs> I did on my dog. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, and, and just during that time, I realized, look, I, things are, this is one big bad sandwich that I'm eating and I'm not enjoying it. And things are, I'm even getting closer to the edge. So uh, one of the dog handlers told me about Georgia Nemetz, uh, the psychologist. So I said, look, I got to do something. So I went and saw her and the, you know, so you get kind of emotional. Uh, <laughs> um, 
just having someone. Non-judgmental, someone to listen and under, who understands what's going yeah, on. Yeah, it was, it was an objective like, third party that said, yeah. dude, yeah, you're like, I can see why you're kind of messed up. So, and, but on the other hand, it's like. I bet you never enjoyed someone telling you you're messed up. Yeah, but on the other <laughs> hand, good. but but on the other hand, she says, but you're not that messed up. Good like, you. like yeah. look what you got going for you. So, again, that all started, you know, everything started, you, you've got that support. So that was very key, was 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 making that, taking that step. And uh, so she was great, I think, because she says, well, you know, no point sitting around. So she said, go, you know, so I said, well, I'm going to take a motorcycle trip. So I ended up taking this trip. And uh, on the way back, um, beautiful sunny day in October, 100 degrees out, one in the afternoon. I remember seeing a car stop ahead of me, just oncoming car slowing down, flashing its lights. And then I remember seeing a great big deer standing in front of it, big four point white tailed deer with that pissed off look in its eye. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to stop in time. And uh, so I try to get around it and I hit it. I remember seeing the nice little chrome rims on my brand on my my motorcycle flying off thinking this is gonna hurt and uh i remember waking up on the side of the road and uh just thinking just let my legs work just let me be able to move my legs because i looked down and my they were they're messed was, up they're messed up and uh so the legs moved that was good so i moved my body all the way up and then i passed out and uh i remember hearing someone say look we need air ambulance here and they said, they can't, it won't, there's not running today. And they said, he won't make it. So don't remember, it was an hour and a half code three run to the nearest hospital, which was Podunk, Utah. Um, where the, Where is that? Yeah, Loa, Utah. Like, believe me, it was, <laughs> there was one OBGYN working in the emergency. <laughs> and, uh, and you know what? I remember being in the ambulance and all of a sudden it was just, don't worry, the things are going to, like there was something as bad as it was. I just knew this was, you know, that it wasn't, this wasn't it. At first I thought it was, yeah. but, uh, and then in the hospital, I mean, I'd been punctured by the antler. I'd been severe concussion, separated shoulder, but really considering what I went through was, I mean, I talked to the paramedic, paramedic months later and said, thanks. I don't remember much. I remember you're great. And she says, I can't believe you made it. She says, I thought you had multiple internal injuries. She says, I thought you were gone. Um, so again, that's, and I remember when they, in the hospital, they, uh, they said, who should we call? And I said, I got no one. And that was, that was kind of a, a telling time and a telling point because since that time, and when you'd sort of tell that story, everyone says, well, you should have phoned me. You know, but, and realistically, I ended up phoning up a buddy. You probably had dozens of people to call exactly. really, but you exactly. don't recognize it at the but time. you don't see it at the time. Yeah. And uh, I actually phoned a buddy's wife because I knew they flew a lot. They fly dogs around. And I said, look, I need a flight home. I've just been in a motorcycle accident. Um, give me a flight from Salt Lake City tomorrow and, uh, and I'll pay back. She says, don't worry about it. I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. Next day, her husband flew out, drove from, flew to Vegas, drove from Vegas to Utah and picked me up and drove me home and basically flew me home. So, you know, again, what a, you know, like, yeah. you just don't expect that. So, um, you know, going through that, everything's, and so then there was, you know, did the test for the pancreas, didn't have cancer, which was good. Um, you know, they basically said I'm at a high risk, which I get checked for every year. I mean, the, they're pretty, they're pretty honest about it. And chances are I'm, I'm at a very high risk and that's probably the way I'll go. But, uh, like I said before, told to just give me enough notice so I can spend my money and I'll, <laughs> I'll go out. But, um, so yeah, so, I mean, you know, there was a recovery there, a physical recovery, but it's, you reach that low point where you just. I don't know what it was, but it was like, look, if for some reason I'm still around here, I'm going to make the best of it. When was, were you back? So mentally, obviously you're still dealing with trauma. That was your relationship breakup, the depression mm -hmm. that set in. Uh, you're physically now not 
what you used to be, right? Yeah. You've been in this motorcycle accident, obviously you've fully recovered. You're in great physical shape now. So I want to make sure that anyone listening doesn't think, <laughs> you know, you're in here yeah, in a I wheelchair. Uh, but, but where, where, like what happens? What, what is the point where you can think, you know, you're going to do something different here? You know what? I think, you know, and, and I think there was something in that, I mean, in the ambulance where it was like, look, you're going to be here. So, <laughs> you know, if, if this doesn't kill you, then, you know, I mean, the boys would joke. They say, yeah, great. You survived the accident. You're going to come home. You're going to die of pancreatic cancer. <laughs> and uh, I say, yeah, great. Yeah. I would like to I'd rather go rather have gone quick on the road in Utah. <laughs> um, but I think there was a point there where it's just like, you know, this is it's not going to be that easy. You might, you know, let's make the best of this. And then I think I think that physical breakdown was important, too, in that, you know, I've been through so many injuries over my lifetime with dog handling and that sort of stuff that you just throw yourself into rehab mode and you rehab yourself out of it. And I think as that rehab mode, I went through that physical rehab, you know, I was still seeing Georgia. Um, so there was a combined physical, emotional rehab. And that was great. Like, I mean, that's sort of what got me going. I was fortunate enough to meet a great gal um, who is sort of the antithesis of she's a OBGYN so she's bringing kids into the world she's very positive you know I'm seeing them on the seeing them going out she's seeing them going in so it was <laughs> so you know and, and the thing is and you start realizing that there's a lot going on and a lot of positive that 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 life has to bring and it's just how you perceive it so I mean and, and everything was going great and so we have you at this point in time, you're rehabbing yourself physically and mentally. You've got a strong, stable relationship, which is helping tremendously. And someone who's medically trained always is helpful as well. Yeah, Because they understand. Helps. Absolutely. And you're still seeing uh, Georgina Metz and a psychologist to be able to help you work through those things. And what happens? Well, I mean, as part of the job, uh, obviously, um, I'd taken a job with P professional standards and it was a six months secondment and I was doing really well. And at the, sort of the end of the six months, they, they came to me and they said, uh, my supervisor said, look, do you want to stay in professional standards? Take the night, think about it. And I went home and thought about it, came back and says, you know what? I like the job, but I'm single here. I don't have any support network. I don't have a social network. My social network is work. Being professional standards, you lose that. And I said, look, I, as much as I'd like to stay, because I, I, I did enjoy it, uh, I think for my own health and welfare, I think it's best that I leave, you know, that I, that I go somewhere else. Um, I was told the next day that management said, no, you'll be there till you're retired. So a bit of a blow. Um, so I was sort of dealing with that. And But again, I, I, you know, whatever, been through things before. Organizational know. stress, right? That adds to the it, whole it piece. Does. Yeah, absolutely. And then... Uh, I got a call from uh, from my ex, and she'd been involved in a in a an accident. And she phoned me, and she said, "I just wanted to talk to you." She says, "I was in the hospital," and she said, "Your name was still down on the um, as as my next of kin." And she says, "I f I see." She says, "For the first time, I know how you felt in Utah." And so, anyway, I said, "You know, I was very concerned about her." She phoned the we she phoned left a message the next day. Sorry to phone you. I shouldn't have phoned. Um, I'm okay. So uh, a week later, I got a call in the morning, and uh, it was her again. And just by fluke, I mean, there's a lot of factors that I don't know why they work that way. But I was actually able to answer the phone, and uh, I immediately could tell something was wrong. And you know, that was I mean, that was her last phone call, and basically. She, you know, she committed suicide while well, right there. So, um, again, not something that you that you can mentally prepare for. It's something that uh, you know. It's 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 definitely a critical incident, and uh, it definitely had a profound effect on me. Um, can honestly say, had it happened a year earlier, I would have I would have followed suit probably right then. Um, because of where I'd come from, because of what I'd gone through, um, you know, I was able to get through it. Um, again, there was a lot of support there. 
a lot of support from my colleagues. Um, there was a lot of support from from people everywhere. I mean, you know, and I was very fortunate because, you know, being the ex, um, you sort of worry that people are going to hold you responsible. And I know there are some that do. Some people that didn't know me that had only come into her life after. But I know a lot of her friends reached out to me and that was humbling, um, you know, that they were very supportive. A lot of Abbotsford members, I mean, you know, um, I'd met, these are all her colleagues and I knew them as colleagues myself and we'd become friends, we'd gone for dinner with them and they actually reached out and they actually were very supportive. And, you know, again, that's a humbling type thing. And, um, you know, and it's, you, you, you experience something like that and it, it's, it's life changing. I want to capture sort of what, what I think I've heard you say. So please correct me if, if I'm wrong here as well. And I think there's three things you, you've reminded us of. So it's hard to think of someone who's been able to go through so much trauma in, in relation to a relationship that, you know, has been destructive. You know, it's very difficult, although on the outside it looks like the perfect home and yet there's lots going on on the inside that's, that's leaving you with emotional scars. You have uh, some organizational stress, as, as we all face, right, with different things happening within the organization. You go through a significant car accident where potentially you could have died. You come back and now you have a suicide. And you're here before us today, and I think you're reasonably well adjusted. <laughs> you still look wonderful. So, I mean, uh, and I, I think you've got some secrets here, and, and it's important for us to share that. Uh, you you rec- said you received support from friends. And the big thing, I think, for people is to recognize there are people out there that are your friends that sometimes we don't recognize as well. When you were laying on the road in Utah and you said, well, I don't know who to call, you know what, finally you were able to find one person that builds. And and the second time it happened with the suicide, you you had that list of friends to call. You you talked about getting professional help, always great, right? For someone who understands, knows how to be able to provide proper clinical advice and but it takes a big step to be able to go see someone because as you mentioned you saw other people and didn't get engaged so that's a big step and the last thing I think is that uh, you've stayed you know physically fit and and the you know being physically fit you you commit to some disciplines of being able to get to the gym and that helps as well with your mind and and sort of what you apply to what else would you say has helped out a lot of it is just as it's an attitude thing I mean you know and manifesting you you can't control the past the future is going to happen no matter what and the only thing you really got is the moment so you might as well make the most of that and you got two choices you can look at it and look for the negatives and things or you can look for the positives and if you look for the positives it's going to change how you feel I mean my wife is very big in manifesting what you want and I mean who would have thought you know she was from Scottsdale Arizona she manifested she she knew what she wanted she's now got a job in Bellingham we've got a house we've I mean it's it's uncanny how she's living proof of what that does and then and the thing is I'm kind of the skeptic I'm the 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 bitter (laughs) bitter jaded cop but it, it does work if you are able to look at life and look at a situation and look for the positives it doesn't mean you have to be in lollipop put your lollipop glasses on and be you know unrealistic about it but if you're able to look for the positive things it's gonna affect how you feel it's just you know and, and again you know being physically fit makes a huge thing is a huge difference it's you know when you hit those times of stress your body is going to undergo you know can undergo undergo severe trauma like the accident well i was probably in the worst shape of my life at that point but i was still from a lifetime of fitness i was able to i mean that's what got me through it was yeah. i was strong and i was i was in relatively good shape yeah. and i mean those if you can look at things and be positive about it and maintain do what you can it will work out i mean it's when you start i mean and it's true you get into that spiral and one thing goes wrong and another thing goes wrong and it just seems to compound itself 
It's true. Whether there's vibrations in the universe or not. But if you're on the positive vibration, it seems to go a lot better than when you're on the negatives. You're a week away from retiring. So, uh, I mean, congratulations on that as well. You, you've had a, a career of experiences and, and been a great cop. Uh, you've gone through some significant issues. And I think what you're leaving here and you've honored us with today is with your story to be able to help others who may face challenges in their career. Over 26 years, you've, you've faced some challenges through both personal and professional life. And I'm hopeful that your message today will capture um, some of the young officers that we have listening, some of the first responders we have listening, to be able to actually leave them with something that they can then use for themselves as they go through. And may, many will face similar struggles or, or their own struggles in their own personal lives. So I, I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your frankness. I appreciate the fact that you have blessed us with this opportunity. So thank you and uh, the very best. Oh, Anything welcome. you want to end with? Well, I mean... You're, you're never totally useless. You can always be used as a bad example. <laughs> and, uh, and, and again, and, and I mean, and, and, and a lot of things I did were wrong. And again, sometimes you have to go through it. Uh, but if there's something that someone else can take out of it and gives them that little bit, you know, of help and maybe prevents them or whatever else, then it's all worth it. Absolutely. And I appreciate the, this opportunity. And I think it's this is a sign of the changing times. I mean, when I started, I remember going to uh, Sid's death. And my staff sergeant at the time told one of my colleagues, take him out, get him drunk. And uh, the next morning I was, <laughs> oh my God. I was brought back and sat down. You're okay? Yeah, you're good. So, I mean, things have changed. And I mean, which is a good thing. It's all positive. You're a gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. These productions never come without a lot of work from everyone involved. A big shout out and thank you to Constable Aaron Hill, Melissa Granham, and Nikki Hewitt for producing and recording, and of course, post-production done by Podfly. Next week on Bend, Don't Break. If a member goes to a SIDS death, you know, it's just two members, they get in the door and they, and they listen to the mother's keening, uh, and it rips their heart, because it should. I expect them to take a knee and get better and not lace up their boot and pretend it never happened. For more episodes, you can find us on all major podcasting platforms like iTunes and Google Play. If you have a story to tell, let us know. Go to deltapolice.ca slash podcast to submit your idea. And don't forget to connect with the Delta Police Department on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Once again, thanks for tuning in. 